we should say to Diane Feinstein, we want to know who is be how many drone strikes are happening, who is being killed, and what is your proof that these people are militants, and what have you, our government done to capture those people? We want to know. We want to say to Diane Feinstein, there must be an end to signature strikes. The other issue that came up is that there was a hearing where John Brennan had to appear. And uh, thank goodness there were groups like Code Pink uh, <laughs> that said, we're going to be at those hearings and we'll be damned if we're not going to get up and speak out against the drone program at those hearings. And so we had 12 people prepared to get up and say their piece. And if it meant getting arrested, they were going to get arrested. Uh, we don't do these things to get arrested. We do these things to say what we need to say. And one by one, people got up and said things that were very profound. Like, Diane Feinstein, why have you not been doing your job? Are your children more precious than the children in Pakistan? And the woman gets hauled off for saying that. And the next woman gets up, and she stands up, and she says, I have a list, John Brennan, of 176 names of children who've been killed by the drones. It seems that you have not seen this list. Can I give this to you? And she held it up. She was dragged off by the police, one by one, until after six interruptions, Diane Feinstein said, OK, that's enough. Code Pink and all of the Code Pink associates must leave this room. <laughs> we thought that was pretty funny, because who are the associates? So we looked around. We said, we're all associates. And she said, then everybody except for the staff must leave this room. So the public hearing, at least, was I mean, we made a stink, and she had to close it to the public, which was, um, I guess, good. <laughs> but then came the, the, the day of the vote, and that's when Rand Paul had his day. Senator Rand Paul, Tea Party favorite, got up for 13 hours to talk about drones. Now, his issue was this very narrow one. It was, will you use the drones to kill people here in the United States? And the administration was absolutely ridiculous and should have said, if they are not engaged in combat, no, we will not do that. But instead, would not give him that one word answer and gave him instead then 13 hours to pontificate about drones. So while he was focused about the use of drones here in the United States, because that was the issue that he felt would concern most of his constituents who weren't particularly concerned about killing poor people of color overseas, but were concerned was, might it take away my liberties here in the United States, but in the process of 13 hours, got a lot of good information out there. I don't, and raise your hand if you watched any of that filibuster. Well, it was an astounding thing to watch, but what most astounded me was to see, uh, Ron pa uh, to see Rand Paul, uh, Republican Tea Party favorite Ted Cruz, uh, Marco Rubio. I mean, these are right-wing folks. These are right-wing folks that want to take away Head Start, want to end the whole Department of Education, want to take away Social Security. I mean, these are not our friends in terms of general issues about how we take care of each other. These were the heroes in that debate. They were the ones that came forward to defend human rights. And we, as Code Pink, went out uh, to, the, to the Senate and went knocking on the doors of the senators we went to Barbara Boxer. We went to Dianne Feinstein. We went to the progressives. We went to Al Franken. We went to Elizabeth Warren to plead with her. We went to Tammy Baldwin, a wonderful new senator. We went to all of them, and then we said, please do not let this incredibly important moral issue be put in the hands of heroes who are the Tea Party favorites. Where are progressive Democrats? Why aren't you speaking out against this? Do you know that all of those people that I just mentioned voted for John Brennan? Do you know that Barbara Boxer voted for John Brennan? It is pathetic. It is wrong. It is immoral. And what I want to talk to you all today is what are we going to do about it? 
Dianne Feinstein has tremendous power. We have to say to Dianne Feinstein, the CIA is not a military organization. It is a civilian organization. The CIA should not have drones, lethal drones, period. That's the end of that discussion. We should say to Dianne Feinstein, we want to know who is be how many drone strikes are happening, who is being killed, and what is your proof that these people are militants, and what have you, our government done to capture those people? We want to know. We want to say to Dianne Feinstein, there must be an end to signature strikes. Do you know what signature strikes are? So there's one called, I hate these terms, one's called personality strikes. It's really the hit list. We, it, all it means is we know your name and we're after you because we know who you are. We know Dave Clement. We're going to go after you. <laughs> Sorry. The other is, huh, what? Your family gets killed in, in the process. process. That's oops, basically. The other is the signature strikes is we don't know your name, but we've been watching you. And we've been watching you and we don't like what we're seeing. It looks like you might be a militant. It looks like you might do something to harm us. And so we are going to kill you on the basis of suspicious activity. And that's where most of these people are getting killed now. Because we see a bunch of guys with turbans and beards and guns, and we say, aha, that's Taliban, and we go in and kill them. And you know what? In that part of Pakistan, guys walk around with turbans and beards and guns. And so we have to say to Dianne Feinstein, an end to signature strikes. We have to say to Dianne Feinstein, what is this thing called secondary strikes or double taps? It means you send in one round of Hellfire missiles and you haven't killed enough people, so you send in the second round. And what are you doing? You're killing rescue workers. You're killing people who are going in to help the people who got killed in the first round. And you know what that is? It is a war crime, pure and simple. That is a war crime. So we have to talk to Dianne Feinstein. And who better to talk to Dianne Feinstein than leaders in the religious community? The religious community has been all too silent on this. All too silent on this. There are you in this room who have spoken out. But where is the rest of the religious community? We go and we talk to Jesse Jackson all the time. We say, Jesse Jackson, we got to do something about the drone strikes. He says, oh yeah, those drone strikes, they're terrible, they're terrible. And then he says, follow up with my assistant. We follow up, we follow up, we follow up, and nothing, nothing. Jim Wallace. We've been trying to get him to speak out for ages now. Can't get him to speak out. Where are all these religious leaders and why aren't they getting together and saying, Barack Obama, we need to sit down with you. We need to talk to you. That has to happen. John Kerry, Secretary of State, let's get the religious leaders. Sit down with John Kerry. Let's talk about something called diplomacy that we need. Reconciliation, peace talks. We need these meetings to happen. Religious leaders could actually get meetings probably with the CIA. Religious leaders could probably get meetings with the Pentagon. Religious leaders have a lot of legitimacy in this country, and they have to use that voice, and that voice is not being heard. So that's the main message I wanted to give today. On the positive side of things, people are starting to wake up out of this stupor. When I came here the last time and talked to you all about this, I quoted a poll that was done that showed 83% of Americans said it was OK to kill people overseas, um, terror suspects with drones, which are just is utterly astounding. Terror suspects. You've never been accused of anything, you've never been tried of anything, and you've never been guilty, uh, found guilty of anything. 83% of Americans. Now it's down to 62% of Americans. Because we have been getting this word out. How was the question asked? Well, that's a, that's a good uh, uh, question. But it, it, there's ser several polls that ask it in different ways. And they ask things like, is it OK to use drones to kill terror suspects overseas? And they say yes. So it's still the majority of people, but it's not the overwhelming majority that it was a year ago. Public opinion is starting to shift on this. And it's even shifting when they asked about the CIA using it. There was less support for the CIA. And so that's a, a real opening there for us to push to get the drones from the CIA. We're not going to get rid of these drones. 
let's be uh, rational about this. There was way too many of them. Get them from the CIA into the hands of the military, and then we try to put some real checks and balances in the way the military is, is using them. And end the war. Of course, you end the war in Afghanistan, you're not going to have the Taliban in, in, in Pakistan trying to cross over to kill Americans. But you, you are going to have more still uh, a lot of push to keep using these weapons because it makes money. So let me move into that separate, that other thing is who is making money from this? General Atomics is one of the companies that making a lot of money from them, this, and they are two hours away from you. They're just down in Southern California. And I just came from, we had uh, four days of uh, intense protests uh, in Southern California focusing on General Atomics. Um, they make the, the, the Predator and the Reaper drones. We went and protest at the factory. We went and protest at their headquarters. And what I found most exciting is we went and protest at the home of the CEO, Neil Blue. And that was really great because we, we went, uh, some of us dressed up in our billionaire outfits to thank uh, President Obama for all the billions of dollars that are being spent in drone money now and to show the, the lovely mansion that uh, Neil Blue has. Um, but we also brought our little drone. You know, you can buy these little drones on, um, online now on Amazon.com. And we had a little, little drone. We painted it pink, and we took it there. And we had said that in our press release that we were going to fly a drone over Neil Blue's house. And so the police were there um, showing up. And they were very nice to us. They let us do our protest, even though they said it's illegal to protest at somebody's home. Um, then we got ready to launch our drone. And uh, then the police got very nervous. And they said, uh, no, you can't do that. You need a license for that. And, uh, <laughs> and this is a tiny little drone. It weighs like less than a pound, I think. And um, then we launched it. We got it up in the anyway. And then the police are going crazy. Oh my god, you know, we got to get the drone down. We got to get the drone down. And they get the drone down. And they said, and we said, why can't we, you know, just fly this little drone? And they said, Somebody might get hurt. <laughs> so that was pretty funny. Um, we had uh, four days of really educating people in the San Diego area, and we had a lot of good press about it. And we would like to also just talk to you about how we can uh, join forces with the folks in San Diego who really need uh, reinforcement in that work, because that is the drone capital of the world, is San Diego. And then right here in uh, the LA area, you have another company, uh, AeroEvironment, that is making a lot of drones. And they're making small drones, but these drones, small drones, can not only be spy drones, but lethal drones as well. But to just get a sense of where this is going and where a community like this can get involved, um, in terms of the uh, domestic use of drones, this is something that the airspace is going to be opened up to drones by 2015. There will be tens of thousands of drones flying in our communities unless our communities do something about it. And this is something that is really catching on now um, because there are about three dozen police stations that have experimental permits to start using drones. Uh, these are the tests to then have all police stations in this country. Uh, we, uh, the, the Electronic Frontier Foundation has been filing Freedom of Information Act requests to get this. We've got some of them, but we don't have all of them. Uh, but it is important, uh, many communities that thought, oh, my community would never want to get a drone, like Alameda County, uh, say, oh my goodness. Um, but there has been a backlash. Seattle, for example, got permits and bought two drones. The community was so up in arms about it that they forced town hall meetings where there was so much shouting going on and the mayor recognized the huge opposition that he apologized and returned the drones. So um, that is very exciting. There are some communities like Charlottesville, uh, Virginia, that has passed no drone legislation. There are, on the statewide level, dozens of states that are in the process of 
uh, some kind of legislation that would either call for a moratorium on the use of drones until we know that they, we can protect our privacy and our safety, uh, or they are calling for drones to be only used if there is a, uh, a court order for them, uh, or some kind of variation on them. There is some new uh, wording of legislation that the Bill of Rights Defense Committee just came out with this week. Uh, with the different options that communities can look at. And it's a great way to get the conversation going uh, in your community to bring it up to the city council to try to get some kind of ban or restrictions uh, on the use of drones. So that is another way to localize it and to bring in new members of the community. Uh, these, if used in the community, they will allow spying to happen on a 24-7 basis. I mean, surveillance will be ongoing. And when you think about who would be the target of surveillance, <laughs> Black community, the Latino community, the peace community, the environmental community, any kind of dissidents, and certainly the Muslim community, the Arab community. Uh, and there are lots of uh, conservative Tea Party folks and libertarians who do not like the idea of drones being used in, in, in their community. Uh, so there's a, a lot of outreach to be done on that. And what we can do is, as the discussion happens, just as happened in the case of Rand Paul, talk about the use of drones overseas as well. So those are th that's a, another way to localize it. And um, many people in this country who think it's acceptable to use these um, think it's because the US is exceptional. And uh, not only are we exceptional in that we only do things to kill bad people and we're the good people, uh, but also because we're the ones that have these, this technology and others don't. And that is rapidly changing. And that's good talking points when you talk to other people, which is this is not nuclear weapons, this is not really hard to uh, get hold of. And according to government reports, there are now 76 countries that have some type of drones. Most of them are for surveillance drones, but they are manufacturing these drones then to be weaponized. So you buy the surveillance drones and then you weaponize them. And it's not just the United States that's selling them. Actually, the number one exporter of drones is Israel, selling them to about 50 different countries all over Latin America and to the poorest countries in Africa right now that really do not need a new weapon. And then there is China making lots of drones. and. Um, uh, even South Africa has become a big manufacturer of drones, including armed drones, and, and South Africa just announced that they were selling armed drones to Saudi Arabia. The Iranians have drones. They have given their drones to Hezbollah. I mean, this is an arms race in drones. And the United States has indeed led the way, not only in the production of these and in the use of them, but this idea that we can go anywhere in the world we want, kill anybody we want on the basis of secret information. Why shouldn't other countries and non-state actors do the same thing? So we've got a lot of work to do to try to rein in uh, this new toy in the arsenal that our country has. And one of the other ways to do this is also reaching out around the world. And I was just in the World Social Forum where we held a, a drone meeting and there were 15 different representatives of country, 15 countries present there. And they all had some connection to the drones, either being on the receiving end or their countries were buying them. And they said, we need to create a global anti-drone movement. And that's what we're in the process of doing right now. I'll be going to London next week. We're talking about how to launch that. And people in other countries are very excited to be in solidarity with us against these weapons. And another thing that we have done is reached out to the people on the receiving end of drones. Took a trip to Pakistan. In fact, I see Susie Gilbert here, who is uh, with us on that trip. And we are in the process of organizing a trip to Yemen right now. Uh, we're hoping to do that in June. Uh, we think it's important to go to Yemen for two reasons. One, because uh, people are being killed by our drones there. 
and also because the majority of people in Guantanamo uh, who have been cleared for clearance and have not been released are from Yemen, and we want to uh, meet with their families and show support for their families. So if anybody's interested in perhaps going with us on a trip to Yemen, um, you can see me afterwards, and my colleague uh, Jody Evans, who I think we should give a hand to for all the great work that she and Code Pink do locally. Um, that maybe you could talk to Jody about that trip as well. And I just want to end with a few anecdotes from our trip to Pakistan because it was such a profound experience. And imagine that we had 32 people who agreed to go to a country where all we hear about is violence, violence, violence. And we get to Pakistan and the first thing that happens is uh, the acting ambassador for the United States in Pakistan says that he must meet with us. And we have a meeting with them and he tells us how dangerous it is for us to be there and we shouldn't try to meet with drone victims and people from the Taliban uh, know we are here and want to kill us. And then we are supposed to go on a caravan up to the northern areas, the tribal areas where people are being killed with the drones. And the day that we're supposed to leave, he sends his security guard in with an urgent message to say, do not go on this trip. The Taliban are trying to kill you. They have, uh, uh, they have uh, camels and donkeys strapped with explosives and they're gonna blow you up. And um, the delegation, all of us scared because, you know, we don't take these things lightly, but we were all determined to go anyway. And we get on this caravan, we go as close to the tribal areas as we can go before the Pakistani government actually uh, blocks our way. But we do have a chance to meet with uh, drone victims, with family members, and we do have a chance to address a huge crowd of people um, who had never seen, they said Americans hadn't been in that area for 10 years. And imagine you know, how nervous we are as we walk onto the stage and we hear people uh, chanting in English, welcome, welcome, we want peace, we want peace. And it was such an incredible experience. And we got a chance to get up and say, we do not agree with our government's policy of killing people by remote control. We think that your children are as precious as our children. You should have heard the crowd go wild when we said that. And um, saying that, you know, this is not the way to build a peaceful world. This is only increasing the cycle of violence and, and other ways must be tried. We must look towards reconciliation and peace. And there were uh, uh, Pashtun men in the crowd who said, you know, I have hated Americans. This is the first time I've ever heard an American say anything like this. If you came to win our hearts and minds, you have won mine. And we were on the front page of every newspaper. We were on the TV uh, every single day. And a woman came up and said to us, you have done more to improve the image of the American people than the billions of dollars that your government throws into this country year after year. And so we learned something I think that people in this room know very well, that if all they see of America is predator and reaper drones that are raining hellfire missiles on them, what we are doing is we are reaping hellfire. And that's what we will get in return. And if we go there and we say to them, your lives are as precious as ours, if we go to them and say that we respect you, if we go to them and say that we love you, that we show compassion, we will get that love and that compassion and that mutual respect in return, which will make us infinitely safer than any Hellfire missiles could ever do. So thank you so much for the work you do. Let's build the peace we all want to see. Global Voices for Justice is a nonprofit media organization. Our mission is to bring to you independent thinkers and analysts who enhance our understanding of the world we live in. Your financial support enables us to achieve our mission. With a minimum $12 contribution, you will receive a copy of this talk. Thank you.